Is there room for a story about baseball in this? I had signed, been signed to a film at Fox uh, to do um, Thieves Highway. I had no sooner reached the, my desk when there was a call from Joe Mankiewicz, who said, do you uh, play baseball? I said, yes, I enjoy playing baseball. And he said, excuse me, but do you mind making an audition? <laughs> I said, what's that for? Well, there's a very big game this Sunday, MGM versus Fox, and we're missing an outfielder. Uh, would you audition? I passed the audition. And it was a really huge spectacle. MGM, Gene Kelly was the captain of the team, and they wore the 1900 baseball costumes, mustachioed, a big spectacular spectacle. And I was the hero of the game. I could do no wrong. And when I got back to my office the following day, it was sort of Monday, there was a call, call your agent, Mr. Lastfogel, urgent. This is a Hollywood story. And I did. He said, did you sign your contract? I said, yes. He said, oh. Wrong. I could have got you a lot, of mon a lot more money after that baseball game. Hollywood. Night in the City was made in 1949. Five years later, 1954, was Reefy Fee. In between, there was a void. No work, except I was able to sell, again, my friend Daryl Zanuck, some film stories which kept me, us, and the whole group of us alive. But it was an you know, unemployment time, unemployable time. Um, so many aspects, when one thinks of blacklist, that uh, well, immediately first you think of all the people who are kind of destroyed by it, many who are friends, many who never worked again. Some of them got by with writing scripts with other people putting their names on it. But it was painful stuff, and it was painful to see good guys just broken down, broken down by threat of no work, and there was a, all these family problems. Your wife would say, what do you want us to do? What are we going to about raising your children? Well, we don't care about your principles. You think of your family. And a lot of that happened. I remember one particular story that was really so painful. There was a man whose name was Robert Rosson, you know, who has made some very good films. And he at first said, you can't do this to people. And he just said, I will not cooperate with these uh, committees and the questions. And, uh, well, we faced things. We had things written on the walls of our houses and insults, you name it. And he had to deal with his kids. And he explained to them why it was wrong to name friends and betray people, and made the kids understand that. And they handled it well. But then Bob broke down, and he named all kinds of people. Now he had to explain that to his kids. And those kids, I don't know how they are now, but they were in bad shape for many, many years. There's so many things I can tell you about the blacklist time, so many stories, some, some of it funny, some of it embarrassing, some of it painful. See, we, we thought it was all so wrong that we did call people to testify and break them down and they would give names. We would be unhappy, sad, but we always expected someone 
to be our heroes and speak. And uh, when they were broken down, we hurt. I'm talking about people like uh, Clifford Odets, of course, Kazan, and others. And each one was a, a heartbreak. Because first of all, these were all friends, and we thought principled people. And it was very difficult. And it was also, you finally, to save people from being embarrassed who didn't want to be seen with you, you spare the embarrassment by hiding away from them. And I remember at a Cannes festival with some film, maybe it was Reefy I don't remember. Uh, I saw Gene Kelly coming my way, and I just hid somewhere so that to spare him possible embarrassment. And then I found an iron grip on my arm, and it was Gene who said, what do you think you're doing? And I said, well, Gene, he said, come on. And at that time at the Palais, there were hundreds of photographers and had to go up these steps. And Gene took me like this. He was the only American there who would come near me. I don't want to mention names. I said, one guy hid under a table not to be seen with me. So that was all stupid and painful. 1951, yes. And I was asked to come to do a film with Ferlandel called Public Enemy Number One. And the uh, shooting date was set. Jaja Gabor had been cast to play in the film because the French had an idea that she was a huge star because her photograph was in all those magazines that they sell. And um, maybe a week before shooting, not be much around that time, Zsa Gabor came uh, weeping, saying, uh, I can't be in this film because uh, I was called from America and was told if I worked with Dassin, Dassin, I would say that, um, I would not be allowed to work in Hollywood anymore. This was followed by another message from abroad. This came from a man called Roy Brewer, who was the head of the Technicians Union in California, who told the producer that if he worked with me, the film would never be released in the States, nor would any other film he ever made be released in the States. So I was asked to leave, and the French got very angry about this. In fact, they get very angry. And they called it, as you said, L'Affaire d'Assin, wrote about for a long time. But there was much more than that that happened. In a succeeding film that I made, that was also sent to Cannes called He Who Must Die. And uh, there was, each country at that time, probably still does, gives a reception. And the Americans are giving a reception. And uh, the press would come after me and say, were you invited? And I said, no. And quickly, this is reported and it became a noise. Last time is not invited. And finally, they thought best to invite us. And that was funny. That was really funny. Because the receiving line, and most of them were American stars. And we were supposed to be. And boy, they were so clever, such full of technique. How do you do? Or turning a glass, you didn't see a face, but you saw us being greeted. But it was a lot of fun. As a matter of fact, I was in uh, Rome preparing, imagine, one of the great classics of uh, uh, Italian literature based on a book by a marvelous man whose name is Giovanni Verga, a novel called Mastro Don Gesualdo. But uh, that film was blocked too. Uh, I was asked to leave Rome as un being undesirable. 
and um, I went to the American Embassy to try to see who could who I could talk to about this. I was not received. The ambassador at the time was Claire Booth Luce. Well, there's a whole big story about that, and uh, the film was not done. The producer was scared off. And then a guy called me from Paris and said, hey, I got a film for you, which turned out to be Rififi. Let me, let me start from the beginning with Le Breton and the film and the outcome. When I met Mr. Berard, the producer, he said, here is this book. Read it quickly. The title was Rififi chez les hommes. And uh, this was a Friday evening, if I remember well. And he said, Monday you must come back and tell me yes or no. And I rushed to take the book with me. I could understand nada, nothing. It was written in a very local argot where people outside of Paris wouldn't understand. And it was an idiom that was just, just beyond me. I, I, truly from page one. And I called the man who had, who had called me to say that I have a job. He's an agent, dear Claude Briac. And I said, Claude, you must come and read this book to me. And he said, oh, please don't do that to me. Don't do that to me. I've been courting this girl for so long and she gave, finally gave me this weekend. I said, you lost your girl, come and read it to me. And he did. And I was shocked by a lot of it. And I decided on that Monday to go tell Mr. Berard that I didn't want to do it. But uh, there were hunger things and taking kids. My children were with me and Paris' wife. And, and I heard myself say, oh boy, it's great, I love it. And uh, this man, Briac, uh, otherwise I wouldn't have known what the book was about. And I got the screenplay done very quickly. And I remember this marvelous meeting with uh, the author. His name is Auguste Le Breton. And we met he, the producer, and I. And he said, I read your screenplay. I would like to know, where is my book? And I said, well, you know things do when you adapt and film and more, and the, the usual blah, blah. And he said, that's very interesting, but where is my book? And I repeated some of the blah, blah. And believe it or not, this man, who I think patterned his whole behavior after Actors like George Raft in American movies always wore a hat. And uh, not being satisfied with my answers, I see this man take out a gun and put it on the table. And he said again, where is my book? I looked at the gun and I looked at his hat and I began to laugh. And because I laughed, because I showed no fear of his hat or his gun. He took me in his arms and we became very good friends. Auguste Le Breton, who just died some months ago. Nice man. I had trouble with the producer of Rififi, Henri Berard, on two counts. One was that I refused to shoot when there was sunlight. I just wanted it gray. And this is to drive him mad. He had these beautiful sunny days, and I said, I don't, want, I don't want to shoot today. So that was a problem. But the more amusing problem was at that time, the star in moving pictures in, in France was an American. His name is Eddie Constantine. And he became very proud because Eddie Constantine, in every film, would have these fist fights and he would be great. And my producer would say to me, uh, well, uh, I will, we have a fist fight. And I'd say, tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow. And to the end of the film, he said, oh, no fist fight. 
but aside from that, no problems. And I tell this story that he offered me this job for the same reason that I was blacklisted. Because he said, you are the only guy that can make this film. I said, well, really, the only? He said, yes, I tell you, we have a problem. All the bad guys in this book, it was an adaptation of, of a Serie Noir book, <clears throat> he said, all the bad guys are North Africans. And France, you know, at this time, were having serious problems with Algeria and so on. And uh, you'd be perfect for us where you can make the bad guys Americans. And so I asked him, had he ever thought of making them French? And you know, he hadn't. So finally he accepted that they'd be French. That's how I got that job. Suddenly, the actor that had been cast for the part of César, le millionaire, uh, was not available because a contract hadn't be signed, had not been signed. And so I played him and made up a name called Perlovita. And there I was on the screen, acting away in Italian. Pardon. I don't think any of that was in the book. I may be wrong, but I, I think nothing that was in the book. And particularly his, his death. Um, and there I was just thinking of all my friends who in a bad moment during that McCarthy era betrayed other friends. And that was what I was writing and thinking about. The novel, Rififi Chez les Hommes, uh, had all kinds of strange things happen, uh, cruel things, including necrophilia. And I didn't know what to do with it. I at first said, no, I don't want to do this. But there's a passage in the uh, book which had to do with a robbery which was to finance a big, greater project. And I ceased upon that to make, build a screenplay, most much of screenplay around it, and uh, make it a high point in the film. And uh, many people ask me why uh, silence, because there's not a word spoken for a long time. And I said, these are professional guys who work in silence. Noise is an enemy. All men adopted uh, noiseless shoes, so to speak. And I thought it was right for César to have ballet slippers. I enjoy that. I like the uh, man who wrote the music for the film was the wonderful Georges Auric. And he said, ooh, this is a very long sequence, because it goes almost about a half hour or so before and after, of no dialogue at all. And he said, I'm going to write you a big hunk of music there. And I said, don't, don't do that. I, I don't want music. He said, listen, I'm going to write music to protect you. You can't go around the film half hour without a word said. And the producer sided with him. And he wrote it. He wrote a huge piece of music, and then uh, I asked him to come to see the film once with music and once without music, and it was Auric who said, no music, pas de musique, and uh, I liked him for that. On n'a pas marre de fréquenter les pokers à la con. Explique, je te dis. This was an absolute mystery to me. Mapani Webb, the very well uh, respected jewelers, and we came and asked permission, and we were honest, we told them what it was, and they were delighted. I could never understand why. Their reputation, by the way, was not hurt at all, so maybe they were right. 
and um, we had to plant a table and a false window on the street facing Matt Ben and Bob and Webb <laughs> uh, to connect the two of them. And at first, there's a first scene where the three guys meet and they look at the window of, with jewels in it, Matt Ben and Webb. So we built this little table in the street. I have friends <coughs> who say, if your name is remembered in movie history, it was because you invent holdups or robberies. Much of that was my invention, as was another, in another film, satirizing myself in Top Capi, where I invented another, uh, I think I'm a crook at heart or something. And also, I guess what's left of the old rebel in me is that I like authority being conquered. So I always want my guys to succeed. And since I'm on their side, I try to find good things for them to do. However, there was one thing that was interesting to me in preparing that robbery scene, how to get into a safe. And I talked to one of our technicians about it, again, talking about crews. And I said, what I would like is the theory of a can opener. And he said, well, I'll, I'll get that for you. And he came with this whole contraption, which operates as a, on the principle of, of a can opener. So, uh, no, it's, it's the crook in me that some, some press and some governments attacked the film, saying it was an educational process. It taught people how to uh, become robbers and steal. And in some cases, sadly enough, the, they used some of the techniques that we'd had in the film. And I know that in Mexico, after uh, 11 weeks, since things began to happen, little guys began to steal some of the process. And so they st stopped the film. But when I'm asked about it, I answer part cleverly, part true, saying, no, this film shows how tough it is. You shouldn't try to get into adventure like that. It's too hard. That's my answer. There was very little money to make the film. If you tell people what the budget was, they don't believe you or they laugh, so I won't get into that. But it affected the casting. There's very little money for the actors. And I was able to get Jean Servet, who had been almost a star in French films, but he hadn't worked for many, many, many years. And uh, so he was ready to work for little money. And that was a very happy choice. Dear man, a very good actor. And then we had a man who had made very little movies, if any, called Robert Manuel, who had made reputation on the theater and the Comédie Française. We had Robert Hossein, who it was his first film. Magli Noel had played in once one or two small films. So the casting was done from the point of view of economics. But I was happy with all of them. I had great luck in having a brilliant crew. But I've been lucky with that most of my life. I had good crews, and many of them are still my friends after all these years. And they were not chosen by me, maybe one or two, Tronaire, so forth. But th they came because of Agostini, who had also not worked for a number of years. And so it was lucky to have a really brilliant crew. And I remember saying, well, the Americans are not alone in this. But you know, 
there are good crews in every country. They are kind of aristocracy of the working class, and they, they're, they're inventive and caring people. I was truly lucky in the, in the uh, crew. And again, the editor of the film was not chosen by me. I didn't know anybody. But uh, the man who was chosen was named Roger Douer. And he's wonderful. First of all, a dear, beautiful, handsome guy, and an excellent cutter, excellent editor. And uh, once you get away from uh, MGM and company, suddenly you're free, and nobody tells you what to do. I was my own boss. Nobody dared say, cut this or take this way. You, you were free to do it. And so working together with Roger was a daily pleasure because I learned much from him. And I thought the film was very well cut. And uh, some friend recently referred to the final sequence of that whole trajectory through Paris until he reaches where he has to go. It was beautifully cut. No, again, good luck. It was good luck there. The thing I remember most about Cannes in 1955, I was paid very little money to make the film. It was just the guy taking advantage of a situation. Um, and I was there with my wife, and we were just plain broke. And the producer went to play in the casino. And I watched him, I was envious, and I said, give me a little money so I can play too. So he gave me some bills. And I said, what is the uh, date that we began to shoot this film? And he said, uh, the 18th. So I took all the money and put it on the 18th, and bang came all this money. We lived on it for a long time. It was very interesting. While I was making the film, um, there was the enjoyment of, of, of these friends, the actors and the crew, but I had no idea what would become of the movie. And when I finished it, it was not a complete cut again, but my friend uh, Louis Milestone was in Paris. And I said, please come and look at this film and tell me what it is. Tell me what you think of it. And I ran the film for him, and I remember his saying, now you listen to me. You now go make this film, the same film, all your life. He said, like Hitchcock, he made that film all his life, and he is Hitchcock. You make that film all your life. And then I said, well, maybe it's good. <laughs>